have you, Itai, and all yours. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm really excited to tell you today about how my lab is studying tumorogenesis using new methods of single cell RNA-seq and uh, spatial transcriptomics. And before I get started, though, I just want to thank a lot of the people that have been working so hard to make this possible. In particular, Kelly Scott has been working for months uh, to prepare all the, the uh, behind the scenes work of the catering and the rooms and the things you never uh, think of but really have to happen to make such a large conference like this possible. And uh, Kim and Eva have also been helping her in our institute, um, and I'm very grateful for that. So, also before I get started, I want to give a plug to evolution. You would think evolution doesn't need a plug, but um, I, uh, I insist it does. So let me tell you about this book. When I was 22, I finished my degree in computer engineering, and I, um, I picked up this book. I, actually, I picked it up for the second time. The first time I picked it up, I, I had a misunderstanding. I thought it was about people found a gene for being selfish. That's what this book is about. And so I, I didn't bother reading it. But when I read it the second time, uh, when I really read it, uh, picked up the second time and read it, it blew my mind. I, I, when I closed it, I was already a biologist and uh, never went back to engineering. And I think I should make a, a new rule for, for members joining my lab that they have to read this book because it's just so crucial. The, the main thing about it is that Richard Dawkins taught us, and it really wasn't his own innovation. Um, his innovative aspect was more just to describe it so clearly. What was, um, what was sort of common knowledge in the field of evolution, which is that um, most biologists have biology upside down. And um, it's a radical thing to say, but I think it's true, that when you take the organism, you look at it, and you can't think that the genes are there to serve the organism. That's just the inverse of what's happening. The organism, or as Richard Dawkins calls it, the survival machine, is built by the gene. It's their mechanism to get to the next generation. And the reason why this is a crucial distinction is because if you understand that, you reinterpret everything that's going on in the cell as a strategy by the gene. The genes are cooperating. The genes are competing. And it's all in this fight for survival where the organism may be fleeting. The organism may be 43 years old, but the genes may be billions of years old, and they, they survive, they flow on. Uh, Richard Dawkins said at one point that he, re he half regretted calling it the selfish gene, he should have called it the immortal gene, because that's really what the book is about, the gene is immortal. And um, you might say, um, why is this important? Uh, if you're going to talk about cancer, and that's what this talk is going to be about, tumorogenesis, I think it is uh, Im relevant. If you think about it, cancer is not something that uh, uh, happened in the past or may have happened in the past, if you talk to some creationists. It's, uh, it's something that's happening all the time. Right now, uh, in people's bodies, there are cancer growth. That's natural selection in action. The, every time you take antibiotics, you're performing natural selection on the microorganisms in your gut. In, uh, in, the, in the testes, there is natural selection where some spermatogonia are being uh, selected for because they're faster developers. Natural selection is happening all the time. You don't need to speculate about the past. So um, also before I get started, I want to mention the people in my lab. These are my lab members, and uh, I won't talk about all of their work. I, I just want to focus uh, on uh, Mayan's work and is this on? No. Well, on Mayan's work and on Ruben's work. And um, unfortunately, I won't have time to talk to about the other exciting projects. So. I'll talk about aspects of uh, development, about atlas building, and about cancer uh, cell states that we call archetypes. And um, this all has single cell and spatial uh, aspects kind of interwoven within it. So let me first tell you how uh, my lab became involved in single cell transcriptomics. I feel we're, we're kind of like part of the narrative of, of uh, single cell RNA-seq, which has been so exciting uh, to watch unfold over the the past few years and to be a part of. And for us, it was a very humble beginning. We were a lab that, that studied developmental gene networks in the very humble 
nematode C. elegans. And the reason why we chose this, this um, organism, which might seem obscure, is because it's, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful model. It's a beautiful, simple organism, whereas um, you have trillions and trillions of cells. It only has 1,008 cells. When it's born, you know, and it hatches, there's only 558 cells. And the number is so few that John Sulston actually drew the entire lineage after years of observation. And for this work, he shared the 2002 Nobel Prize because he discovered that one-sixth of the cells also commit uh, suicide, undergo apoptosis. And that mechanism was worked out in C. elegans. And in my lab, in order to understand gene networks, we really needed to focus on specific cells of the embryo. So for example, you see this, this cartoon of an embryo right there. That's the 15-cell stage embryo. We always, you know, you know, we wanted to know, for example, at this stage and stages afterward, which genes are on there. Like if we, if we could just figure out which genes are coming on at this stage, and then at the next stage, what are the, what's the new wave of genes, we, we wouldn't have to even build models that are too complicated, we would just have the network sort of fall out. That was the, the dream, that you could just observe it and also observe how the cell fate decisions are occurring. The problem is we didn't have the technology to zero in on an individual cell and systematically inquire every gene. You could use uh, fish to look at individual genes, but not everything at the same time. And um, we tried uh, the Tang et al. method, that was the first single cell RNA-seq method from the Sirani lab. It didn't work in our hands. We paid a lot of money for enzymes. It didn't work. We were really frustrated. Um, we, we saw a talk by Stan Linarsen, who introduced uh, the START method, and he had this great idea. We were kicking ourselves for not having thought of it ourselves, which is just to introduce a sample-specific barcode and therefore, you wouldn't have to sequence just one cell per lane. Because in the Tanganol method, you know, uh, in the Lumina lane, it would just be one cell. So it would be really expensive. And it didn't work in our hands. Um, two big problems. So we, um, we, we wanted to use START, but it was unavailable. The protocol hadn't been published yet. And we thought in our lab, wait a minute, we just have everything we need to do it ourselves. Because we were doing microarrays, DNA microarrays, and for that we had a really sensitive, beautiful amplification protocol uh, called the Eberwein protocol, which is in vitro amplification. You basically take the RNA, make it into cDNA, right? Once it's in DNA, you can amplify it up and then sequence. And so we decided we could just take the notion uh, uh, of Stan Linarsen of adding a barcode and use our um, CT7 promoter there, implement the in vitro amplification. And that was the birth of CellSeq, and it became super um, efficient, simple, reproducible, accurate. Uh, in, in 2016, we updated it with CellSeq2, where we optimized everything and changed a, uh, a few things, and we arrived at 21% sensitivity. 21% sensitivity means that if a cell has about a half a million transcripts, you're detecting over 100,000 transcripts. And, you know, that was great. Um, I think m many methods uh, these days are, uh, have kind of compromised that sort of sensitivity in part to get more uh, uh, cells. So actually, this sensitivity is pretty unmatched. And using this uh, cell seek, we were able to, to query the C. elegans embryo. This, what you're seeing is a map, the, the traditional Tizni plot, where every dot is a cell that comes from the C. elegans embryo, and it's a bunch of embryos for, from different stages, uh, kind of like all shown in the same map, so it's, it's not so informative, but we could do even better, because the way we did it is in a really sensitive way. We, we really treated each cell as like a gourmet cell. We, we took each, each embryo, and from each embryo, like for example, this embryo up top, we opened, up, opened it up, individually froze each cell, right, and did the cell seek 2 protocol. So at the end, we can now know that, ah, if we match a certain identity to one cell, it cannot be the same identity that's delineated to another sample because they come from the same embryo. So you have additional information by this, this uh, contingency of collecting the, all the cells from a particular embryo and, and knowing it. And using this information, we were able to, to um, sort of bring the, the Sulston cell lineage 
to the single cell RNA seq world, where for every line now, you know, every line here is, is a, a cell, but now if you can imagine, every line goes deep in and gives you the gene expression level of every single gene, right? So we have 20,000 maps like the one shown on the right. There, it's for a gene called CEF43, and you see that CEF43, it's blue at the beginning, you see it's blue, and then it divides, more blue, more blue. That means that the gene is off. It's off, 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 and then in, a, in particular cells, it comes on, that's the red. In other cells, the daughter cells next to it, it's, it's still off. So you know with single cell, full lineage sensitivity, exactly where each gene is expressed. And we can use these, these um, maps to, to summarize it, summarize things in a big, bigger kind of atlas. And here you see uh, for just a few genes in which cell it's expressed. And you kind of get this, this uh, um, image of every cell being a kind of, um, having a kind of barcode in terms of which genes are expressed in it and which genes are not. Um, we looked at which parts of the genome are, are opening up and we saw clustering, so, so particular uh, genome regulatory modules are clustered on the genome and uh, particular expression profiles are forming dor dorsal ventral stripes and all sorts of, of beautiful intricate uh, developmental uh, discoveries that we made, but I won't go into that here because uh, the focus is going to be more on tumorigenesis. So where is CellSeq uh, today in 2018? We continue to develop CellSeq. Uh, Gala Vital in the lab uh, used CellSeq as a um, template for and adapted it to actually get two transcriptomes from every cell. Right? So we thought it was a, a great trick to just have the transcriptome from an individual cell. Now we have two transcriptomes from an individual cell because if that cell is infected by a pathogen, those transcripts are not polyadenylated, right? If they're not polyadenylated, they're invisible to traditional single cell RNA-seq. So Gal updated it uh, using random priming and a bunch of, of tricks that were really difficult to work out, but Gal braved through it, and uh, we published this method. That's SC DualSeq. We also have uh, AppaSeq. AppaSeq allows you to uh, distinguish different alternative polyadenylation forms, isoforms, using the cell seq data. And perhaps uh, of more impact for what I'm about to say in this talk, three and four um, are implementations of cell seq. On a, on, a, on a different scale. So in the microfluidic uh, sphere, there's a whole set of droplet methods, which is uh, DropSeq, 10X, and InDrop. So InDrop is really an implementation of CellSeq. InDrop uh, in is a microfluidic implementation that runs on the uh, CellSeq chemistry. And um, let me show you. So in, in uh, our lab, a couple years ago, we published the um, uh, we took a complex tissue, the pancreas, and we applied INDROP to it, and we were able to identify the different cell types and the different uh, cell states, and that was really novel for us at the time. Now it's, it feels like it's so traditional. Uh, another implementation of CellSeq is spatial transcriptomics. So spatial transcriptomics allows you to take a tissue, right? Imagine that you, you now cryosection the tissue, and uh, you put that onto a DNA microarray. What the DNA microarray has on it are a bunch of spots in a lattice where each spot picks up not the expression of an individual gene like DNA microarrays in the old days, but rather the entire transcriptome. So the transcriptome that you get is now spatially uh, barcoded. And um, we're proud that they used uh, CellSeq for uh, the chemistry there. And actually just today you may have heard the news that uh, 10X has acquired the spatial transcriptomics company. So what is spatial transcriptomics uh, good for? Well, if you think about uh, tumorigenesis, what you, what you need is a map. You feel that, that if you could just see what, what is going on in there, you could figure out what's going on. Right now, when you look at a, a section of a tumor, the most common form of doing that is with H&E staining. But with H&E staining, you can only tell so much, right? You, it's, it's hard to discern uh, uh, you know, genotypes or cell states, and uh, you can only get kind of like a, a, a brute force, like, like a rough estimate of what's going on. So what would you like? What would be, what, what ideally would you like to have from a uh, tumor atlas? I would posit that you'd need to get a parts list, first of all, 
just an itemized list of, okay, I've got the macrophages, I've got the cancer, fibroblasts, everything. Next up, you, you would um, know where are they. So here you would see, you see in this top view, the, the, the T cells are, are over there in this region. And um, that, that's already pretty good. I, th I would say that's already beyond what H&E staining could, could do today on a broad scale. But furthermore, you would want to know what are the cell states, right, for the the um, macrophages, are they pro-tumor or anti-tumor macrophages? For, the, for um, the macrophages, are they M1 or M2? And furthermore, you would want to know for the cancer cells within, within that, th those regions, what is the clonality? We know that there's tremendous tumor heterogeneity in, in tumors. Uh, many times it's because there are, are different lineages that may be carrying out specific roles. We would want to see that in the map. So uh, Ruben Moncada in our lab is uh, uh, busy uh, implementing this idea, and let me show you what, what Ruben is doing. He, uh, the notion is that, um, first of all, we're in Langone Health, which is uh, an amazing uh, hospital and research environment. It's really integrated, and that allows us to collaborate with clinicians and to literally stand outside the operating room and acquire uh, a tumor that was just minutes ago in a patient, it, once it clears pathology, we, can, we uh, can use it for research. And what Ruben does is then he immediately splits it into two. One half is going to be used for spatial transcriptomics and the other half for single cell RNA-seq, okay? So the single cell RNA-seq, uh, Ruben is able to do the kind of stamp collecting of identifying which which cell types are present. And this is very similar to the, the pancreas data that I showed you um, before. Yay, I can make it work. Uh, stamp collecting, make it work. But, uh, but there's also the, uh, a new cell type that we didn't see in the pancreas data set, and that's the, the cancer uh, cells. Okay, very good. Um, I think, you know, m many of us that are working with single cell data uh, can appreciate the kind of um, uh, kind of um, nervous feeling that, that we get now when we have TSNI, which is uh, kind of like that, now what? Like, what, what do you do with it now, right? Now that I have the TSNI, what does it tell me? What information can it tell me? And that's what we're really looking to, for, to, to spatial transcriptomics to inform the, the, the cell types and the cell states that we see. So here's the spatial transcriptomics. What you see here is the H&E staining uh, from a PDAC. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, pancreas uh, ductal carcinoma, and you see that the pathologist has annotated different regions, like this is the cancer region, and you have the ductal epithelium, and so forth, okay? And then the, the, what's the raw data? The raw data of spatial transcriptomics is for every gene, where is it located? And you might say, oh, wait, spatial transcriptomics can replace single-cell RNA-seq altogether. Well, it can't because ST, at least for now, Better days are ahead because of 10x, probably, but uh, for now, it's not single cell resolution. So you see this resolution here. Each spot is really giving, is really an average of like 20 to 50 cells. So uh, this is the data. You see like for this gene, it's expressed here. This gene is expressed there. That's the raw data. What can you do with it? One first thing you could do is to do principal components analysis, okay, because every uh, in the same way that you do principal components analysis on single cells, you can do principal components analysis on these spots, right? Because each, each ST spot is an entire transcriptome. You can see what is the, what is the PC, get the, get the PC score for every spot and map that back on to the location. And you see, for example, PC2, um, the, 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 the score for these transcriptomes is high for PC2. So that means it's, it kind of registered a sort of regionalization in, um, in ST, in the, in the spatial uh, slide. Uh, furthermore, we can cluster it using this, this sort of idea. This was clustered with k-means, not PCA, but it's the same idea. And uh, I just want to uh, highlight for you that we formed four clusters. One is the cancer, right? One is the duct. One is the normal tissue here, and then perhaps the most interesting is this black one, which is the, the tumor adjacent, the cancer adjacent, right? And you might think that, that the, the cells that are just in between the normal and the cancer are expressing something else. Okay, so hold that in your mind for one second, and then let's go to the ST side. 
So on the space, uh, sorry, on the uh, single cell RNA seq side. So here, let's take just one cell type, the macrophages. You can see that if you look deeper into the macrophages, you can identify different subpopulations, right? And this has been known for for many years. You didn't need single cell RNA seq, but it's nice that the single cell RNA seq data recapitulates the the uh, existence of different states. Okay, so we have uh, three states that we that we describe here, and we have genes that are specific to to each state. And now we can ask if for each population, um, where, where are they? And what we found is that one population is a little bit higher in the cancer adjacent region, while uh, the, the, another, the second population is actually higher in the cancer relative to the cancer adjacent. So this is still work that's ongoing, but what we're, we're, beginning, what we're beginning to unravel is not just the, the stamp collecting of the different cell types and their cell states, but also their, their spatial arrangements. And now let me show you a second approach that, that, uh, that we've developed to, to integrate single cell and ST, which I'm very excited about. This is to first identify modules of genes that are co-expressed across space, okay? So you can, you can imagine that the ST is really just a gene expression matrix, right? You've got for every gene, what's the expression across all the 1,007 odd spots, okay? You can now... Uh, just cluster and make a matrix that's gene by genes, where uh, gene A and gene B will be highly correlated if they go up and down together across these spots, okay? And so you see that there's uh, one cluster here, right? The, all these genes, uh, there's more, uh, Ruben is just showing uh, every tenth the gene here. So there's many more genes here. And um, you can look at where they are. So this one particular module, spatial module five, we saw that the, those genes in the module are, tend to be in the cancer region, which is really interesting, right? So you, you identify genes that are co-expressed, and now you can map them to the region in this particular region you're interested in. You look at which genes these are, because you can remember now that for every gene, you also have the single cell RNA-seq data, which tells you in which specific uh, cell type it's expressed in. So, uh, you know, you, you have one cluster here that's, uh, you see all these, all these genes here, they're very dark green. Dark green is asinar, so all those genes are asinar genes. That's a pretty, kind of like a boring one. There are other spatial modules that are composites of many genes, and that kind of gives you insight into the, the microenvironment. Uh, for example, what you could do is this you can ask for a particular spatial module, what's the enrichment of different uh, cell type genes? Okay, and let me tell you what this works. You can take, um, this is really an integration of the ST and the single cell RNA-seq. From the ST, you take a set of genes, like for example, spatial module five, for example, okay? It's a list of genes. You now have another list of genes. These are the genes that are expressed in just asinar cells or the list of genes that are just expressed in the cancer cells, okay? You ask, using the hypergeometric distribution, is there overlap higher than you'd expect by chance? And that's what you see uh, here on the diagonal. So, for example, uh, epithelial, epithelial, see? Uh, it's, it's sort of enriched. So spatial module 5, it's, it's a pretty decent uh, minus log 10 p-value. But if you now take a combination, if you take the epithelial and the cancer genes together, make like a superset, the union of the cancer genes and the epithelial genes, you see that you get a super enrichment, right? This is a crazy enrichment, like, like uh, 30 zeros after the, the, uh, the decimal. So really what this is telling you is that you, you identify spatial module, and you learn from the single cell RNA seq data which cell types are enriched, which cell types are spatially located. And uh, we can do this on many modules, right? Many, for every spatial module, we can now kind of um, uh, untangle which cell types are present. And we could also go and do this by cell states. For every cell type, we delineate the different cell states and see uh, how, uh, which ones are spatially located. So just to wrap up this section, I think this is what we would want from a, a cancer atlas. We would want to have all this information, and in, in doing so, we will see which subpopulations are, are, in, are close and interacting. Okay, 
the second story I want to tell you is about a parallel project in the lab that was interested um, more in time, the temporal component of, of uh, tumorogenesis. And this is a project that's led by a PhD student, Mayan, in the lab. Mayan is uh, uh, not here today because she's in Boston interviewing for postdocs, so uh, too late for UPIs trying to recruit her. Um, and she, this is a big collaboration with Rich White, the wonderful Rich White from uh, MSK, who's a good friend. And uh, the reason why we started this collaboration is because we felt that, that the fish is such a, a beautiful um, model system for cancer. In the same way that C. elegans was for development, the, the fish um, allows us to, to study a tumor over time with and without treatment. And the, the way it works is you take a zebrafish embryo, you inject an oncogene that is driven by a cell type specific promoter, right? And now, let's say the cell type specific promoter is a melanocyte promoter. Now when the fish grows up, only in melanocytes will, will this oncogene come on and the fish will get cancer, melanoma. So we were able to now sample this melanoma, process it using, a single, cell, using single cell RNA-seq, and we get the TSNI. And the TSNI identifies many uh, cell types. We've got keratinocytes, fibroblasts, and all those light blue dots, that's all the cancer cells. So we wondered what would happen if you just study now the, the cancer cells in isolation, and we got this shape. And I think, I think many now in the community are, are uh, receiving this, but when we saw this a year and a half ago, we were really shocked. Um, you know, we, we always thought, oh, these are just cancer cells. They're, 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 um, you know, they're maybe all doing, uh, um, they're, they're all going backwards in developmental time. They're all doing, they're all expressing the hallmarks. We expected a sort of uniformity out of them, and here we saw that they're, they're really, um, you know, almost diversifying into really distinct uh, uh, vertices on this triangle. So what, what is driving this? Like, why, why are some cells expressing, uh, you know, why are some cells disposed here? What's, what's, what's really, is this, is this a bug? Is this an artifact? What's really driving this? So we don't think it's an artifact. We see that really there are G cancer cells that are expressing very different genes. This, um, this gene, SOX2, is expressed in these cells right, in sharp contrast to uh, the DCT gene, which is expressed in other cells. And yet uh, uh, a third set of cells express June. And these genes are uh, functioning in a, a kind of a neural crust progenitor state. So SOX2 is, is, uh, um, is, is expressed during melanocyte development, but much earlier on before differentiation. DCT is a differentiation marker, and June is a stress marker. So th these are really sort of uh, exemplifying different states. And you could say, well, this is just, this is just a zebrafish thing. But we don't think it's a zebrafish thing because we reanalyzed RNA-seq data that was published from human melanoma, and we saw the same thing. Here, you see uh, each dot is a human melanoma sample, and you see there's a subpopulation expressing SOX2, a subpopulation expressing DCT, and a subpopulation June. Crazy, right? So it's, it's something that's kind of maybe universal to all melanoma, and we sought to further characterize uh, what, these, uh, what these transcriptional programs are, because it's probably not just, just SOX2, DCT, and June. It's, it's, uh, those are just markers, but there's many more genes. There are many genes that are correlated with each vertex. So um, we decided to, to, call, to, to look at this as um, uh, archetypes. So from now, I'm going to be talking a lot about archetypes. Let me try to clearly explain what I mean by archetypes. Um, this triangular shape suggests that uh, there's something special about the vertices. And what we imagine is that every cell is, is, somewhere, uh, is somewhere along the line of expressing the idealized program that is the, uh, the archetype. Okay, so an archetype is an idealized transcriptional program. No cell is expressing exactly it, but each cell is sort of approximating it. And so we wanted to study what, what, is, what is that transcriptional program that is being, uh, um, you know, kind of like that's the average of all the cells 
around a particular vertex. And when, we, when you study those genes that are enriched for expression in each vertex, you see that in one corner, you have like a real neural crest uh, program. It's, it's really uh, the set of genes that are expressed earlier on in development uh, along, you know, along the path to the differentiation of the melanocytes. A second vertex that we call archetype two has the genes that are correlated with um, differentiation of melanocytes, the more differentiated state. Um, you know, even though it's, it's a tumor, even though it's melanoma, it's still expressing genes that are similar to like a normal melanocyte. And the third population is like a stress module. So um, to, to check this a bit more, we uh, reanalyzed a study that was done uh, studying melanocyte development. So, so you know, they, uh, um, our colleagues at MSK took stem cells and differentiated them into melanocytes, and we have the transcriptome. And now we can correlate our single cell cancer data to each state. And indeed, we saw that uh, our archetype one is similar to the stem cell neural crust state, and our archetype two is similar to the mature state. Okay, so now we kind of uh, said, Okay, there, is, um, there are three states or three archetypes co-occurring in each melanoma. Um, if that's true, we should be able to take bulk melanoma uh, that's already been d deposited into the databases and deconvolve them into the, the um, you know, resident archetypes. So that's what Mayan did. She downloaded 400 deposited melanoma bulk transcriptomes. She was able to deconvolve them. And you see that, that most um, bulk tumors had all three archetypes. And what was interesting is that for each patient where this uh, um, tumor was studied, we also had the, the, some metadata. And what we found was that for those patients that had a higher fraction of archetype one, archetype one, to remind you, is the one that's, that has the neural crest program, those patients that had a high archetype one had a worse prognosis than, than uh, the ones with uh, a less uh, f uh, highly frequent archetype one. So there's something about archetype one that, that also kind of affects the, the, the fate of the individual with that tumor. Now, these archetypes, could be, um, could be something that's unique to melanoma, or it could be something that's, that's general to maybe all cancer. And so we're busy uh, testing this hypothesis now that, that all tumors can be kind of uh, parsed into archetypes. And we already have some, some data suggesting that this is the case. For example, the, the stress archetype, archetype three, we saw in the pancreatic uh, ductal adenocarcinoma, the PDAC that Ruben isolated. So here you see that, that there are some cells that are expressing the, uh, the stress archetype. We also downloaded uh, breast cancer data. This is was published from Nick Navin's lab. And you also see uh, that there are some cells that are expressing this archetype. Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned that, that this project got started because we were interested in the, the temporal aspect of tumorogenesis, and that's really a unique feature of the system where, you know, if you take a, a tumor from uh, a patient, you can study it. But what you can't do is, is like, serially uh, collect biopsies and, and not do anything about it, right? That's, that's, that's not ethical, so you, you can't really study um, tumorogenesis without treatment. And in mice, you can do it, but it's also you have to uh, sacrifice the mouse if the tumor gets too big. So really, uh, we believe the zebrafish is the only system where you can um, map out tumorogenesis at the single cell level from the same individual tumor over time. And that's what we did. For, um, for, we were able to do this for one month, but we're hoping to do it uh, bigger, better, longer in the future. But for one month, every week, we took uh, a, a biopsy from the same tumor. And we think this is the first uh, single cell RNA-seq uh, cancer time course. And um, we expected to see um, huge changes, and we were a little bit disappointed that the, the changes were subtle. So first, let me show you, um, you, you see that, that uh, you know, remember archetype one, two, and three are here, and each color is which week, week is collected from. You see that there's no big difference. Basically, every week we sampled had the same 
frequency roughly of archetypes. And you could say, well, it's just one month in the life of, of a tumor. This, this should be uh, looked at a much larger time frame, and, and I would agree with you. We would also want to look earlier on to see how the, the tumors uh, come about. So we didn't see any large-scale difference, but we did see uh, local differences. So within, within archetype uh, one, for example, and we have this for the other archetypes, within archetype one, you could see how um, the changes, you know, you, you, could, you could ask, is it the same archetype one each time? And it's not. You could see that um, the oxidative phosphorylation genes, those genes, their expression is going down over time. And the glycolysis genes, those genes are going up in expression over time, which um, to me seems like a reflection of the Warburg effect, where a metabolic switch turns um, the production of clean energy into dirty energy, right? And it's just not just this one. You can see for a number of processes, uh, like, like metabolism, a lot of those, those genes are, are going up and signaling pathways, a lot, their expression is going down in the cells expressing this archetype. So we do see local changes. Okay, so let me sum up this part. Um, what I've told you is that in zebrafish melanoma, we found three main uh, states that we call archetypes. These archetypes seem to, to coexist and not change drastically over time. Uh, their frequency is correlated, though, with clinical prognosis, so some change uh, does seem to be uh, happening in humans. And uh, the archetype concept could be general to all cancers, and, and that suggests that maybe we could make like a kind of periodic table of, of cancer in terms of these archetypes, which I find really exciting. Also, I think it puts into frame uh, a lot of other concepts that, that uh, we think about when we think about uh, tumorogenesis, which is uh, tumor heterogeneity and the cancer stem cell. So with, um, with tumor heterogeneity, one way to, to interpret this from our findings is that really each archetype becomes its own kind of clone. And so you have a, a set of coexisting clones that are each sort of diversifying into the, the different archetypes. In other words, the uh, different cell populations may not be transcriptionally plastic at some point, and each clone uh, adopts and maintains a particular archetype. With regards to the, the cancer stem cell theory, it's really interesting because the, um, the cancer stem cell theory, if, if you recall, suggests that, that there are, are, are a set of, of uh, cells that are kind of like in a stem cell state, and they're spewing off cancer cells that are, are kind of like more like the, you know, the, the worker uh, cancer cells. And from our perspective, this is not what's happening. There's actually two, uh, multiple populations that are, are each um, re uh, replicating and without a hierarchy of one to the other. Okay, so now to, um, to, um, to wrap up, uh, I want to thank the people who did the work, which is uh, Mayan, did this uh, zebrafish tumorogenesis, and Ruben, who did uh, the spatial transcriptomics. And to conclude, I, I want to tell you about uh, our lab. You know, every, every week um, we have a group meeting, which is a lot of fun, and we, we do special things. And I think um, uh, probably the labs that you're in, also um, it's interesting how the different cultures kind of evolve in, in different labs. And uh, I want to share with you one, one kind of aspect of the culture in our lab. We, we have a, a term that we call night science. Do you know about night science? So night science is, um, is something that was coined by Francois Jacob. Francois Jacob is from uh, Jacob and Monod, from the Operon. Remember him? So uh, he, he not only was he a great scientist, but he was also a great writer about science. And uh, I recommend you reading some of his books. For example, this one uh, of Flies, Mice, and Men. And he, he liked to talk about the distinction between day science and night science. And so day science, day science uh, needs no introduction. It's a science we all know where we're super critical. We need to do controls. It's all rigor, hypothesis, you know. And uh, <laughs> no introduction to day science. Night science, night science, it's, it's crazy. Um, the public and sometimes even we 
uh, tend to forget about night science, which is crazy. Night science is the crazy part of science, which is hypo which is like brainstorming and eureka, and you you know you have this uh, idea out of nowhere, and you're drunk, and you're you know you're just like it's a free association, and you say stupid things, but who cares? No one's no one's judging at this particular moment. So that's that's more night science, and it's uh, it's interesting, right? That when we teach the scientific method to our kids, to ourselves, we, we talk about day science. We say, what is the scientific method? You have an idea, you know, you have, you, there's, there's, a, there's a problem, you have an idea, that's the hypothesis, and then you test it, right? So straightforward. And then they never teach you, where do you get the idea? Where does that come from? And it's supposedly so mysterious that, that uh, it, you know, we shouldn't even bother teaching it. Well, I think it's uh, something that, that, that um, we should be working on, something that I think about a lot, I wonder if you think about too, is, is how, how can we kind of systematically uh, devise a night science scientific method? And this is what uh, Francois Jacob wrote about it. Night science wanders blind, it hesitates, stumbles, recoils, sweats, wakes with a start, doubting everything, it's forever trying to find itself, question itself, pull itself back together. Night science is a sort of workshop of the possible, where what will become the building material of science is worked out. Night science is where it happens. And then he wrote this many years ago, but if you reread it today, it's, it's kind of terrifying. He writes, in today's vastly expanded scientific enterprise, obsessed with impact factors and competition, we will need much more night science to unveil the many mysteries that remain about the workings of organisms. So true. So thank you very much for your attention. Fascinating talk, and I can't agree more on the night science aspect for sure. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, we actually published a paper that came out beginning of this year. We did actually analyze the same data, the Turish data. We used a combination of convex NMF and archetypal analysis. We also found three archetypes, and also we found, like, we characterized that as well. So I'm very curious to actually take it offline and like talk about it, but in a short, we found association with mid F, mid F low, mid F high, and mid F very high. I was wondering in your if you're in your analysis you have seen any association between your archetypes and the level of mid F. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm gonna look up your paper because I don't believe I've seen it. So with regard to the mid F um, what, what you're referring to, I don't know if everybody knows about this, but in, in uh, melanoma, there's the invasive and um, the, non, the sort of non-invasive, and that's, that's uh, axle and mid-F, respectively. And the analysis I showed you is on the cells that, that are mid-F high, in other words, not invasive, not mm -hmm. axle. Okay. And, and that's where we found the, the three archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to trade notes with you on how you found them in the, in the axle. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so take it off. Yeah. So uh, really cool stuff. Um, I'm actually curious on how you're thinking about how those archetypes map to things like tissue pathology in the context of, you know, staging and grading. So is it that stage four, is, it, is that the same archetypes, but just more cells that the pathologist is looking at? And because, you know, the, um, the uh, zebrafish data you suggest that even, even as you progress or potentially get more aggressive or more developed, they look very similar in their archetypal structure. All right. So does, have you thought about how that maps to staging and grading of cancers? Okay, yeah, so the question is how do, do archetypes match to tumors of particular stages like stage three, stage four? Um, you know, we, one thing we really, um, are, um, are anxious to get started on is to indeed compare metastases to their matched primary tumors because we believe that the, or we expect to find actually different archetypes. So we, we haven't uh, done that, although in many of the melanoma st studies from human, those are actually metastases, 
and we did find similar archetypes. So it may be um, kind of like what I showed with the, with the timing, that it's the same archetypes, but they just get adapted a little bit more. Um, in general, what, what we seem to, to see is that there are um, different, different possible states that a cell can have uh, across the developmental trajectory. It could be kind of like a neural crust, you know, like an early developmental stage or, or later developmental stage. And on top of those stages, you can hang uh, additional modules. So I, I think that's a really exciting uh, aspect that we think about a lot. What is the, the interplay between the, um, the way an archetype is built from both developmental stage and uh, modules? But much more work needs to be done. I have a quick question about the zebrafish experiment. So mm -hmm. as you did the serial biopsies, you noticed that change in the metabolism. And some of that could be attributed to, say, like hypoxia, right? As the tumor gets bigger, mm -hmm. the oxygen diffusion is limited. Mm -hmm. So how do you control for, I mean, so when you do the biopsy, is this going deep into the tumor? Could that explain some of the effects or are these uh, changes that are happening on the periphery as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so are the changes that we're seeing, can they be attributed to hypoxia? Um, hmm. So um, we, 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 do, we do kind of like stick the needle deep in and we, we try to get uh, cells that are not uh, just on the, on the surface. And, and even if we did get the surface, it would be, it would be really few cells. But I think overall, um, you know, in, in, this, in this case, it's actually ST that could be really informative. Because ST, coupled with the in-drop, would be free of, of those sort of ar artifacts. And everything is like frozen together. Um, it should not have that. And I can tell you that one aspect that we also saw uh, about that, that zebrafish tumor is that the stress module was on the outskirts, like that was like a, on the outer ring. So maybe there is a, an epoxic signal, and that's what the stress module is a response to, maybe.